Filippo Grandi has led emergency operations in Yemen, Benin, Afghanistan and many more countries and with kindness, solidarity and openness. That pairing of professional skill with personal values has shaped his role today as UN High Commissioner for Refugees at a time of COVID-19, the biggest threat to humanity in almost a century. What future awaits the world's most vulnerable people, many of whom have no home or access to clean water, but are being told to stay indoors and to wash their hands? And what hope do they have when movement and escape are sometimes their only means to survive, but now in an era of lockdowns and closed borders? These are some of the questions I discuss with Mr. Grandi in this special interview, which at times is very moving as he speaks about the human condition that impacts every one of us. Mr. Grandi, COVID-19 is teaching us to check in on our family, our friends and strangers. So I want to begin with asking how you are and your family in Italy, where you're from. Um, I'm personally fine working from home, as you see, uh, here in Geneva, where I'm based. uh, uh, We are uh, strongly advised to stay at home. And uh, my family is in northern Italy, in fact, in the epicenter of the Italian uh, uh, chapter of the COVID epidemics. They're fine. They're on lockdown. They're behaving. The spirits are good. But certainly um, northern Italy in particular has been uh, um, struck by uh, the coronavirus uh, in unprecedented ways. So uh, it is always a matter of some anxiety and some uh, preoccupation to think of them there and not being able to be with them at this time of ordeal. There are over 70 forcibly displaced people in the world and at a time when that same world is facing its biggest threat since the end of the Second World War, what is that going to mean for the people that you care for every day? Well, first of all, I think we have to say there is no distinction here. The coronavirus is the most democratic uh, uh, challenge we have ever uh, been facing. Everybody's exposed in the same way. But certainly, refugees, displaced people, 70 plus million of them. And if you add also migrants, many of whom are in vulnerable situations, maybe 300 million people are are particularly exposed. They are people on the move. You know, we are all on lockdown. Being on the move today is not what one should be because uh, you risk being exposed to the virus, carrying the virus. So they have this vulnerability. And many refugees, many displaced people also live in very crowded situations, situations where you don't have water to wash your hands, where you don't have space to put a distance between yourself and others uh, without the proper homes within which to stay at home. These are the, 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 the most uh, typical advices that we're getting from health authorities. They cannot do that. So they have some additional vulnerabilities that expose them particularly at this juncture. I mean, that in itself is fascinating and complex and nuanced all at the same time, because the entire world is being told to do two, three things. Stay at home, wash your hands and keep a physical distance from the people around you. So what do you say then and how can people protect themselves if, for example, they're an asylum seeker or refugee, they don't have a home, they don't have access to clean water? And perhaps when you look at the shelters that they may have, that's already overcrowded, as you say. I would say uh, two, three important things here. One is that the main uh, requests that we have made to governments hosting large displaced populations, be they refugees, internally displaced people, is to recommend that these people are included in the responses, health responses to COVID-19, just like everybody else. And frankly, this recommendation is well heard. 
and uh, uh, well uh, implemented because everybody understands that if you have in your country a group of people that is not covered by the response, it's actually a liability, not only for them, but for everybody else. And then we are studying the world map and uh, checking where the situation is particularly dangerous, big concentrations, weak health systems. There we have to bring supplementary support to governments that are facing this challenge, not only for refugees, but always also for the communities hosting them that very, very frequently are in the same conditions, have little space, have poor, uh, poor water supply and uh, uh, cannot really implement the, safe, the basic safety measures that we're all trying to adhere to. So there we need to do more. And this is why uh, my organization, UNHCR, but also many other UN and uh, NGOs, many other organizations are appealing for extra resources to uh, help us bring protective equipment, medical care, improve water and sanitation systems, build additional shelter, and very, very important, uh, step up our communication channels to those affected, to refugees, displaced, and host communities, to tell them what to do. We, ha we are all learning, even in very advanced industrialized societies, how important health communication is, health education is. We're all learning every day how to protect ourselves from these pandemics. This is all the more important for people that are especially vulnerable. Well, UNHCR is particularly strong in communicating the issues to everybody. I was on your website earlier and looking at the top host countries are vulnerable in themselves, countries like Sudan and Pakistan. So in this setting, in this new setting that we are trying to negotiate, how well can they continue to host while also dealing with the new stresses that COVID-19 is pushing onto their public systems? Well, I would say that uh, uh, countries that, uh, in addition, as you say, in addition to their, uh, uh, to their own challenges for their own national population, uh, they have to face uh, health challenges for refugee populations. They need even more international solidarity. You know, one message that this, uh, this crisis is uh, delivering to us very clearly is that we're not alone here. You know, there's a lot of rhetoric in the world. We first, my country first. How much have we heard about this in recent years? Now, this doesn't apply to covid because if there is one country that is not sufficiently protected, that does not have the resources to protect itself and, in this case, refugee populations, we're not out of the risk of the pandemics. The pandemics may be reduced in some countries, but come back from countries that are unprotected. So we need to really have out, I would say, of self-interest and not just because it is good and important to do it, but out of our own collective interest, it's important to help everybody. So more solidarity. This is why we're appealing to all countries that have more means as they respond in their own, with their own populations in Europe, in Asia, in North America, which is where the pandemics is, is spreading more quickly. We're telling them, don't forget, don't forget to share some also with countries in Africa, in the Middle East, uh, many countries which are more challenged. This solidarity is of paramount importance, otherwise they will not manage to contain it. And containment is by one on behalf of everybody. Well, I think too often we look at the world's vulnerable people, those on the margins or off the margins of society as the add-on, the footnote to our lives. But in fact, I think there's so much we can learn from you and what you do, you use the word solidarity because I watched your video of your visit to Lesbos in Greece and in that video you use words like solidarity, compassion, understanding, generosity and openness. Surely all of these words apply very well to what we're trying to negotiate in an age of COVID-19. Uh, by all means and I always say and I want to repeat it again Solidarity has two dimensions, has uh, 
a dimension of uh, common interest. This, by the way, does not apply only to COVID. I do hope fervently that uh, this, is also, this should also be for us a time of reflection, that these big challenges that we are facing in a globalized world need to be faced together with more international cooperation because it is in our interest, as I said, for COVID. But it, frankly, James, it is also our interest in how we fight climate change or the climate emergency. It is also our interest in how we fight poverty and inequality in the world. There's so many global issues that we need to learn to face together. And one of them for sure is the forced movement of population, of large populations. This is also a collective challenge that needs international cooperation. But then there's another dimension. And the other dimension is ethical. I'm not ashamed to say it. We must help others because it is in our interest, but also and perhaps above all, because it is right to help people that are more disadvantaged than us. I want to come back towards the end to have a conversation with you about the sustainable development goals and how this all comes together in the post-COVID world. But today, the United States is said to be almost close to exhaustion of its federal supplies of uh, medical goods. And that worries me because, of course, it is the richest or the leading economy in the world today. How will UNHCR be able to step up for refugees and for others when people and countries and governments are fighting for the depleting resources that we have? This is a very big uh, uh, problem that uh, we have, and may I say that we will have, because, of course, um, uh, refugee programs, aid programs, humanitarian programs on a broader scale depend on international generosity. I am not so worried about the very short term because I think everybody understands that we have, like, let me say once more, a common interest in responding, especially to the health aspects of the emergency. But I am worried about how this will impact in the long term uh, aid, foreign assistance, development assistance, not just humanitarian assistance. This is, a, this is now at risk. We've seen it also uh, in the 2008 and 9 economic downturn. Um, unfortunately, when donors countries, when rich countries have to reduce, reduce their, their budgets because, uh, because of the economic situation, and we are already seeing the signs of an economic downturn here globally, one of the first victims is always aid is always uh, uh, humanitarian and development assistance to other countries. Now, I, I only hope that what I said earlier, and many others, the Secretary General of the UN and many of my colleagues in the UN in the aid community are saying, I hope this resonates, that this is a lesson for all of us. Uh, take, for example, uh, HEAD, which is one of the big sustainable development goal, health, universal access to health for everybody. This is very important because you understand if we have, an, if we, we will have other epidemics, we will have other pandemics and they may be as serious as COVID and even more. And how do we respond to them? We respond to them as we have seen in China, as we have seen in Italy, as we are now seeing in the United States, we respond to them through organized, well-equipped health systems. And this has to be valid not only for China, Italy, and the US, but for everybody, for countries in Africa, for countries in the Middle East, for countries in Latin America that have less resources. So uh, assistance, aid, are very important also to build systems that then can withstand crisis. That's why I do hope that there will be no lowering of the guard when new budgets will be designed next year and they will have to be done and in a situation most likely of financial constraints. I see a map on the wall behind you. If I can transport you now to Jordan, where you have one of your camps, your field workers there changing the way they approach 
their work in this age. For example, now conducting their temperature checks, their screenings at the entrances uh, to these sites. What are some of the other uh, transformations that they're innovating along the way as we learn more about the epidemiology of COVID-19? Well, we, uh, of course, uh, use a lot more virtual means to uh, conduct our work, just as I'm doing now with you, uh, interviews from home to advocate for more support. Uh, but uh, uh, you touched on a very important point. This applies also to our frontline work, day-to-day -day work with people in the field. This is very tough because humanitarian work is essentially person-to-person. Uh, -person. Uh, protection, as we call it, for people that we care for, refugees, displaced, stateless people. Protection is very often exercised through presence. This is really what my organization is about. And that presence today, it's a bit like being on the move. Presence is at risk, is maybe become a risk itself. So that's why, frankly, we need to be very pragmatic there. Where we can substitute presence uh, with uh, te technology, and this is possible, many times we do it. Where, for example, distributions of in-kind products can be substituted by cash distributions, which we have already started doing years ago, this epidemic is likely to boost that modality of assistance because that modality of assistance can, um, can um, utilize virtual means, cards, uh, 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 and so forth. Uh, so all these means, we're trying to boost them and where, as it is inevitable, we have to be present with the people we care for, then we need to have protective equipment. We need to take measures just like doctors and medical personnel do in hospitals. I keep saying that we need to consider in this uh, big crisis, humanitarian workers, just like medical people that are that are on the front line of the emergencies in, in, in cities in China or Europe or North America. Humanitarian workers do the same. Many of them are health workers, but even those who are not, but need to be present, need to be given a protective equipment. This is why one of the biggest priorities, very practical priorities that we have in the aid community today is to mobilize from countries that have this protective equipment that produce it, like China, to mobilize donations of this protective equipment that can be quickly shipped to situations where it is needed. If we know all this, why are our humanitarian workers, including our health workers, so ill-equipped or completely non-equipped at this time? After all, we've been warned for years and again in September by the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board that a disease uh, epidemic or pandemic was already on its way. What happened to all that PPE, that most basic of barriers? How many warnings have we got in the past five, ten years uh, regarding um, um, the climate emergency that uh, is going to be a catastrophe if we don't take measures? How much are we doing about it? Very little. But I'm pretty sure that when the emergency will start to strike very hard, we will say, oh, but we were warned and we're not ready. So the same applies to all these global challenges. So that's another lesson that we may wish to draw from this, ex this painful experience. Now, in terms of equipment more practically, it's very difficult because, you know, production as in China first, now in Europe, has declined or even stopped in many places, including of protective equipment. Uh, shipping uh, uh, lanes and air transport are severely, severely limited by the constraints that uh, uh, have been uh, imposed. And uh, <laughs> therefore, you know, we are now in a bit of a catch-22 where we need to mobilize resources and people, but we are constrained by the same measures that are meant to contain the epidemics. So it's a, it's a tough one that we're trying to navigate. But uh, in the last few days, I think we have made some progress. By the way, the Secretary General has been very strong in also advocating, uh, I, I wouldn't call it freedom of movement, but liberty, relative liberty of movement for humanitarian workers in uh, humanitarian situations. Because if they are obliged to stay at home like the others, 
uh, some very important care to be given to uh, communities affected by the virus uh, could be missing. I mean, people flee for all kinds of reasons, be it uh, civil war, persecution, ethnic cleansing, natural disasters. Is that choice now removed from them because of all these international travel restrictions and internal travel restrictions we're seeing? Uh, This is a a very important point that you're touching on, because here again, we have a big dilemma, right? You know, for many refugees, let's stay with the traditional refugees, fleeing war, persecution, uh, bad governance, violations of human rights. For them, moving is life-saving. Yet today, in this uh, COVID world, moving can be life-threatening for them and for others. So how do you reconcile these two? Now, we have, uh, you know, we are a a pretty technical organization, not just an organization making big appeals. We have a lot of legal expertise and we've been advising governments on how to deal with these issues without completely curtailing the possibility for people who are in urgent need to cross borders and seek asylum. You know, there are are these quarantine methods, the screening methods at borders. We are ready to put resources for countries who have less resources to help them with that. Having said this, we fully appreciate that it is a very difficult moment, that state governments have to take decisions to protect their own population, including refugees who may be already present on their territory, and therefore some constraints are inevitable. Here, the other big message that I want to share with you and that we have shared already is let these measures not be permanent. Once we get out of this emergency, and we will get out of this emergency, we need to go back to normal or to the previous situation. We should not, no government should think that uh, restrictions put in place to protect the health of citizens should become permanent and there and in so doing damage the right of asylum which is a a universal human right i actually want to ask you about how you bring people together because on a personal level you've led many emergency operations in places like yemen benin liberia ghana afghanistan of course uh, many more using that experience and if you think about some of those stories that you've been a participant in how do you unite people? How do you mobilize communities and individuals so that they come together around a common cause and then they work together for that common cause? You know, I, um, when I was much younger, I, uh, I used to work for one of my predecessors, Mrs. Ogata, the Japanese High Commissioner in the 90s. She... Uh, was in many emergencies in Bosnia, in Rwanda and Central Africa. And she always used to say, solidarity is easier in an emergency because I think that the sight of suffering, the, the almost physical realization of uh, what a, an emergency of this type of health emergency, for example, the, 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 the damage that it can create to people is is understandable to everybody. And in a case like this, we also share the same emergency. For the first time, this is an emergency shared by the whole world. It's not confined to a remote situation in a faraway country. So I think that solidarity now is understandable. You know, it is amazing that, you know, we raise funds from the general public in many countries. Um, we, um, We raise funds from companies from the private sector in the last few days it's actually gone up not down this type of support this is a a a measure of how solidarity is strong now my worry is in six months is in a year when we will have to face many other consequences of the crisis one that is very apparent already and i speak here for refugees and displaced but it can apply to many disadvantaged people, many poor people. So many hundreds of millions of people in the world depend on, for example, daily wages. Very precarious means of subsistence. 
Now, these are the first means of subsistence that disappear in a situation like this, where you know, lockdowns, reduce economic activity, countries go into recession. The first, the, the ones that are hit first are the people depending on already fragile incomes. And refugees and migrants very often belong to this group. Think of the millions of Venezuelans in Latin America, for example. This, they are a good example. So we will, make, we will need to make sure that all these people are also uh, protected going forward, not only from COVID, but from the poverty that COVID is likely to generate. They'll be the first victims. And that will require a more sustained effort than even in the health sector. That's what is, is going to be more difficult because once the images of the, of the emergency in hospitals in Wuhan or in, in Milan or in New York go away, it will be more convinced, difficult to convince people to share, to continue to share uh, uh, resources with uh, more uh, disadvantaged uh, 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 brothers and sisters. I'm sure being in self-isolation at home in Geneva uh, means that you're as busy as ever, but perhaps there have been moments uh, where you've been allowed to reflect as you said this is the opportunity for all of us to do. Um, when you think about the world post-COVID, whatever that means, post the immediate emergency or post as we go into an endemic situation, who knows? But what do you think the world will look like when we open our doors and interact with each other once again? First, uh, on your comment uh, on reflection, yeah, that's uh, that's true. You know, yesterday I spoke to all our colleagues uh, through a virtual town hall all over the world. You know, we have 17,000 colleagues in, in more than 120 countries. And I told them, uh, I told them, you know, take advantage, those of you who are confined and maybe half of them are, take advantage of this time also to reflect uh, on, on what we do and how we can do it better. And certainly that's, although I would prefer to be on the front lines, if I may be completely honest, that's, that's, uh, that's what I would like to, to do. But uh, I understand that it is important also to direct an organization from one's living room. Uh, who, who would have said? Who would have predicted this? But in terms of how the post-COVID world, I don't know. I think that uh, I can tell you how I wish this world would be. And I said it already. Let me just repeat it. I wish it could be um, more um, not only aware of the need of for international cooperation, but more committed to it. You know, James, that uh, the Syria war is now nine years old. And uh, if you look at the history of this war and you look um, at how the international community has responded to it, we should be profoundly ashamed. Uh, a war that has produced five or six million refugees, millions of displaced, caused hundreds of thousands of deaths, wounds, separations, poverty. Uh, this war has been somehow tolerated by the world not only tolerated, but fostered through divisions. How can we admit that? How can we live in a world where a devastating war cannot be resolved, and there's many others, because the world cannot work together? Now, can I hope, I hope I can hope that in the future, there will be more awareness that we're not going to find any salvation by ourselves. Insieme preghiamo gli ammalati, le persone che soffrono. Sotto la tua protezione cerchiamo rifugio, Santa Madre di Dio. Non disprezzare... The other day, Pope Francis leading a prayer to the world in St. Peter's Square, deserted. He uttered these words, nobody can find salvation alone. And I think that that's the awareness of this with the challenges that go with it, because we shouldn't be naive, you know. Working together is different when there's so many different political, 
security and economic uh, uh, interest around the world. But unless we do that, we won't overcome it. Now it's COVID. Tomorrow will be climate change. The next day will be poverty and economic downturns. We need to work together and we're not seeing it enough. So that's what I hope. What will happen, I don't know. It may be so that uh, there will be, you know, end of lockdown and everybody goes back to partying and spending and being selfish. It's possible. It's possible. But this crisis is big enough that I think that that message is now going out to many more millions of people that perhaps had not thought of it before. You speak about the opportunity for solidarity because unfortunately, crisis humbles us. It forces us together. And now, since we're separated, we have more time to think about our role in a rapidly changing world. The Sustainable Development Goals promises to leave no one behind. You're a big part of this architecture and its execution. Are we going to be closer to delivering because of that solidarity? Or are we going to be off track when we come out? Well, I hope uh, that... uh we will be, I would say, in a realistic manner, a little bit more on track than we were three months ago, before COVID started becoming known to all of us. The Sustainable Development Goals are a simple, clear, concrete framework of where we should be going to in all areas of human development, from education to the oceans, to universal health care, to reduction of poverty, and so on. The simple. Anybody can understand them. Children in schools can understand them. Now, I think it would be very simple for governments to come out of COVID and say, okay, let's go back to the drawing board here. Are we putting enough resources in the achievement of these sustainable development goals, because this is how it works. States have to put resources, and states that have less resources need to be helped by states which have more resources. And the pursuit of the uh, of the SDGs, of course, is a national pursuit, is the responsibility of individual government, with the UN helping them. But uh, it is also a collective effort, because many of them transcend boundaries, and uh, transcend borders, like uh, climate uh, uh, climate action, for example. So I think that definitely uh, that's the model. That's what we need to look at. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel. The wheel is there. We need to make it turn. I want to ask you to gently steer us to something uplifting, because many people look to UNHCR for solutions uh, for leadership, for hope. Of course, you quoted the Pope and I saw it in your Twitter as well, where he said, nobody finds salvation alone. How would you choose to uplift not only the immediate community that you serve, but the wider community of humanity that you serve as well? The pandemics, the coronavirus is um a source of great fear for all of us. It's obvious, no? It's our head. But uh, look around. You know, you ask me about my family, my country. I I watch the news every day, and uh, from from everywhere. But you can understand, particularly also from my own region, literally. And uh, I see extraordinary examples of two things that we need so badly today: resilience in the face of adversity and solidarity that helps resilience last and be strong. And I think that this is what this uh, terrible situation is also teaching all of us, that uh, we must be resilient, but we can only be resilient together. So mine may sound a little bit uh, too abstract, it's not. Look at health workers in hospitals. Look at humanitarian workers, my colleagues on the front line. I just finished uh, speaking to colleagues in Bangladesh dealing with a million Rohingya refugees in their country and, and trying to protect them and the local communities from the epidemics. You know, these people are risking their lives literally to uh, protect everybody. They should be the examples for all of us because they are 
the ones called now to uh, carry out protection measures, protection work. But protecting ourselves against these global threats, and we have many, protecting ourselves from that is the responsibility of us all. Mr. Grandi, it's an honor speaking with you and more so learning from you as well. Thank you. Thank you, James. The China Current continues its special coverage on the coronavirus outbreak. Go to our social media, at The China Current, and our website for interviews, videos, and podcasts. I'm James Chow. Thank you.